and I think we are live. Hi everybody, happy Wednesday. It's uh, Healthy You Wednesday and we are here ready to get What's Your Path with Car Bookings. It's so exciting to have her here on the show and um, we've already got Minecraft comment streams coming up and we'll let her get to that because I don't understand Minecraft but, but um, we are ready. We're here with Kirsten Hancock, or my famous, infamous wingman there from the UK. You want to say hi? Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Great to meet Kara and hear her pass. Yay! And we're just going to get started. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to Sean because it was on Sean's show that I got to meet you and find out that you hand built your house with your children and um, I live off the grid I've done a little bit of building of things and I can't even imagine what you guys did so I'm just gonna get myself out of the way and let you start your story okay well the first question that people always ask when they find out I built my own house is why so uh, I'll, I'll start with that and my kids and I had been in a really bad situation of domestic violence so we had endured quite a few years of a really difficult living and our self-esteems were really really crushed and not only that but our family unit had really been pulled apart uh, as much as we'd like to think that we all pull together in in a really difficult time the truth is we tend to pull inside of ourselves and away from the people who could actually help us the most and that's what we had done so we needed something sort of big and profound to rebuild ourselves and we also needed a place to live that was inexpensive mm -hmm. but um, my kids still wanted all their own rooms they had big dreams for the house so I had the idea why don't we just build it ourselves and of course I brought it up to the kids and we put it up for a vote and they all thought it was spectacular and we would just you know Google how to do it and um, and that we'd build a house now <laughs> it was a lot more difficult than we anticipated going in but surprisingly I was able to draw we drew our own house plans at the kitchen table and um, I was able to get a construction loan from the bank to buy supplies and the city allowed me to pull all of my own permits as my own contractor and um, I just acted as though I knew what I was doing you don't need any sort of a license to do this surprisingly so I was able to pull all of my own license and and actually break ground and build my own house how did you find the piece of land um, that actually took a little time we didn't have a lot of money for the land because the land had to be paid for in full before I could get the construction loan so the land that we could afford was quite far out of town and we all get motion sickness pretty bad so every time we'd go to look at land we would get sick like halfway there and think okay this is not going to work like we're going to get car sick every time we go to our house and you know smaller bits of land we thought we could build in a neighborhood but you do have to be a licensed contractor in order to build in most neighborhoods they want to have an approved contractor and meet you know very strict um, building requirements for a neighborhood so it was essential that I found a piece of land that was outside of a neighborhood and um, actually one of my, my my daughter's friends parents called me and said hey there's an acre of land for sale over by my house and I called and they wanted um, quite a bit more than I had and I talked them down ten thousand dollars which was still ten thousand dollars more than I had <laughs> but I worked it out um, actually with a bit of a credit card help and um, and I bought the land and then I was able to get the construction loan and start and it, we really weren't truly terrified I don't think until um, the very first day that we broke ground um, I, we really were confident. I mean, we drew the plans and we had this amazing house, you know, that we thought, no problem, it's a square box, we can build that. And we'd watched lots of YouTube videos about how to do this, so we thought we had it down. And um, I showed up on the very first day, the kids were at school, it was freezing cold in January, and I showed up in the tractors here to, I had hired a guy to dig the footer. Um, which is you know the the foundation where the concrete will be poured and it's a couple feet underground 
And we had come the night before, and I'd cut two broomsticks in half and used the handles to, like, mark the corners of the house. And we had, like, cross-measured me cross it with string to make sure it was square, exactly how they showed us on YouTube. And, you know, so we were really proud of it. So we knew exactly... And, and I, you know, I'm there, and I'm all proud, saying, okay, you know, I'm ready. You can start digging. And he's like, well, where's the chalk? And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And he's like, well, you have to mark the foundation of the chalk so I know where to build. And I'm like, oh, there's neon pink string there. Obviously, you can see where, where to dig. And he's like okay, so I scoop one bucket of dirt and then your string is all tangled in my bucket and gone. He said, you have to mark the whole outline with chalk so I know where to dig. And, you know, I'm like, who knew this? They didn't show this in the YouTube video. Obviously, you were already supposed to know that part. <laughs> um, so I had, I had stopped at the grocery store on the way to the build site and bought stuff to make cookies. So I had a five-pound sack of flour in my trunk. And he had said it was powdered chalk that I was supposed to buy, or they have some sort of spray paint that you can use. And I'm like, well, I've got flour in my trunk. So I run to the trunk, and I rip the corner off a bag of flour, and I, like, I'm nearly in tears, because obviously I've screwed up the very first thing to build the house. And I, like, am walking backwards, and I shake this five-pound bag of flour, you know, out onto the ground and kind of give him the thumbs up, and we rip down my pink string. And um, I'm walking back to the car, and, and I look down at the bag of flour, and it says self-rising. And I'm like, oh, God, I hope that works, you know? <laughs> I'm hoping I just planted a self-rising foundation, because clearly I'm not going to do well at this. But oh, um, that's hilarious. So and that, and at that point on, we were pretty terrified. <laughs> Well, that that's for all the bakers out there. Um, it is fine to use self-rising flour to mark your corners of your house. So maybe I'll start a trend. <laughs> um, what? So you you you've got the guy. He's digging the foundation. Your kids and you just start mixing cement because one of the pictures I put up in the in the event was you standing next to a mixer. I can't imagine mixing that much cement. Okay, well, I wish we would have had that concrete mixer when we did the foundation. We did not, unfortunately. Um, and it wouldn't have helped us, really, because I didn't have electricity. I, I had to figure out how to get the temporary electrical pole up, and I didn't know how. So when we started the foundation, and we were on a time crunch. We had nine months to build the house. It was a nine-month construction loan. So I couldn't wait to figure stuff out. We had to just keep moving forward. So um, I didn't have the electricity hooked up, and I was also the plumber. I had pulled the plumbing permit but I hadn't figured out how to hook into the city's main water line because it was under the street. So I had to have somebody tunnel under the street to get to the water line. So when we started building the foundation of the house, which was block and fill, so it's 1,500 concrete block that are seven and a half foot tall in the front of the house. So it's a lot of concrete blocks. Um, we had to mix the mortar. Well, it, it was December and January, so again, very cold. And um, fortunately, my neighbor has a pond. So we walked down the hill and scooped up five-gallon pails of water and carried them up the hill and dumped them in a wheelbarrow and hand-mixed all of the mortar to build 1,500 concrete block. Um, and my 11-year-old, my Jada, who was 11 at the time, she actually um, did all of the what we call the buttering, where you're putting the mortar down to put the brick on top of it. So uh, it was it was definitely a family thing. I should say, I have four kids, and at the time, they were 17, 15, 11, and 2. So obviously, someone was always assigned to the 2-year-old. Um, whoever felt most emotionally destroyed that day got to hang out with Roman, because he was a blast on the job site. I mean, a kid, you know, frogs, <laughs> lizards, mud, rocks, ice, a pond, concrete, you know, it's like a two-year-old's dream. So he was such a delight that whoever was just emotionally unable to handle themselves for the next couple of hours or had too many blisters and aches to continue got to hang out with Roman. So um, That is fantastic. Who would have thought um, knowing how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich was going to give you the credentials <laughs> to be able to butter there you go. So, I mean, it worked. <laughs> you get the foundation board. You guys are, I think I remember a part of your story. You guys are going back home and watching videos at right. night for what your yes. next thing is going to be. 
Yes, and you know, it, smartphones, unfortunately, were not around. Um, I had a BlackBerry that didn't even have a camera at the time, so we couldn't watch a YouTube video on site, which would have been a tremendous help. We lived about six miles away from where we were building, so we would drive home and watch videos at night, like how to frame a wall or how to frame a window. And then, you know, we would go back the next day and be like, so do you remember how they said to do that? You know, and it was the big trial and error thing. Um, we also had this huge book that my dad had mailed us from Wisconsin that was like a, a how to build a house sort of book. Um, it was like this four inch thick manual from like so from the 70s. And we would have that out there like propped with a, book, a brick on top of it to hold pages open and we'd go refer to diagrams and stuff. And um, and we just dive in and do it. So my my shop, I actually have a huge shop too that we built, and it's like 13 by 33, so it's huge, and it will handle like a snow load of 20 feet of snow because I way overbuilt the rafters because we were looking at that book. But yeah, so <laughs> we learned a lot, <laughs> and we were also um, researching energy efficient things the entire time. It was really important to me that the house be inexpensive to live in after I built it because my intent was to be a full-time writer and that income of course is questionable so um, everything in the house is extremely energy efficient I did you know six inch walls and special windows and special roof decking and venting and you know tankless hot water heater um, no windows on the east or west for solar gain in the south and I, I positioned everything precisely for for passive solar fantastic all through YouTube videos Yes. <laughs> and Dad's book. Thank God for Dad. And Dad's book. And I, I hired a guy who um, had built a house before. I thought at the time that he knew a lot more about building than he did. But I hired a guy that I could call and he would come for $25 an hour and like get us started on projects that we just absolutely could not start on our own. It was really hard to get him to show up, but once he was here, I mean, there were several different things that I don't know how we could have done without him just getting us started on them. Um, particularly the foundation, he came and, and showed us how to do the block and everything. But um, So that was definitely a big help, but he didn't have a lot of money, so it was kind of like, can you come over and show us for a couple hours and then can you leave? <laughs> funny. So you guys are Building this house, what was the energy like, Cara, around this project? I mean, were the kids just overwhelmingly excited the whole time? Like, look at what we're doing? Before we started, everyone was overwhelmingly excited. Um, that very, It turned to terror next, I think. And then just the pure exhaustion. You know, I had a full-time job, so I was at the office all day um, writing computer code. And you know the kids were in school, so then I, you know, they'd come home from school, and I'd come home from work, and we'd hit the job site, you know, sometimes for ten hours, and um, the the exhaustion. There was no break. There was no end, and uh, everything hurt. I mean, we were physically not construction workers. We were physically sort of, you know, well, I was a geeky programmer, you know, pasty white from hanging out in front of a machine, so. Um, we weren't physically built for this, and the, you know the kids definitely weren't either. So we d we had a lot of music. My son would, my oldest son Drew, who was 15 when we started, he would always create these CDs, and we would sing while we worked. A lot of singing, pop music, and and some reggae and hip hop, you know, whatever he had, and we would sing these until. We, of course, had them all memorized, and then eventually somebody would just be like, I cannot stand hearing this CD one more, and would like frisbee it across the job site, and that would be a cue for him to make another one. But we still hear those songs, you know, we'll hear those every now and then and go, oh, I remember what we were building when this song, you know, was on our track. But by the end of the build, his CDs had an Egyptian slave symbol drawn on them in Sharpie, and he would draw on the back of his hand an Egyptian slave symbol. <laughs> but um, but they they didn't ever like revolt and say oh we're not doing this I mean it was a, it was absolutely a group and a family effort and honestly it, there was this understanding once we made the decision and once we started and we paid for the land and we had this huge stack of supplies out there you know there's there's bricks and lumber and and all of this stuff and we can't afford to pay someone to put all of that together into a house there's no choice 
there's no going back, there's no plan B, we have to take the stuff and make a house. So um, I, there was that understanding from the start, so it was just this we push forward and make it. Um, it depending on the project, some days there was a lot more happy energy than others. We all did a lot better on projects that moved quickly, like, you know, doing the brick was not a lot of fun. It is extremely slow and tedious. It took us two months to do the, the foundation when we only had nine months to build the whole house. Um, so that put us way behind schedule uh, because we're hand mixing and hand doing everything. But, um, you know, then, then when you're doing like the, the framing work, when you do the actual lumber and you're framing the house, that goes very quickly and you're lifting huge walls and you're seeing your house come together. So it's this huge party atmosphere. And um, and the same thing with like siding on the back of the house that goes very quickly and you have a very professional fast finished look, but then when you're laying 2,000 square feet of hardwood flooring that's two inches across and you can work for 10 hours and you've moved a foot across the floor, um, then the mood is much lower. <laughs> how did the how did how did the kids get involved in the decision making? I mean, was it you know okay? There's fifty thousand choices of hardwood floors, or do we just carpet the whole thing? Did mm -hmm. was it monthly, nightly meetings with the kids? Okay, what do you want to do here? What do you want to do here? The, you know, I think that was probably the one thing that I realized over and over again was wonderful. It was a bit like a dictatorship because. You know, I think if I had had a spouse or something, you know, then then you have to agree. But ultimately, it was like um, you guys are all going to move out, and I'm going to continue living here. So I get final say on everything. I mean, of course, they had they had a huge say. I mean, they designed their own rooms, and you know, we have a little hidey hole under the stairs, and they did. Of course, we all agreed on on flooring. The downstairs is actually stained concrete flooring. That's the concrete slab. And then uh, the upstairs is all hardwood. So, you know, th they had, of course, a bit of say. But there's just, when you have one person, you know, there's only myself and my daughter who could even drive at the time. Um, there are so many tasks to do. You don't have time to sit around and discuss, gee, what color of faucet do you want? You know, you hit the store in one day and you say, okay, we need seven faucets. We need you know, 57 lights, we need five that are for closets, you know, you just go down this list and you're just scooping stuff in. Um, it's not like if you have a contractor building your house and your only task is to pick a few things out so you get to be picky, you know, and you think really hard about it. When you have to not only pick it out but go install it, you know, and, and put the plumbing in before you install it, um, you just, honestly, you're just not as picky about it. it it's... You're just like if it if it functions, I'll be thrilled. <laughs> so it, it wasn't as though we had arguments over the color of anything. Um, it was it was keep it simple. You know, we said we'll paint the entire house a single color, and we'll paint the trim through the entire house another single color. And if someday we want to change any of that, we will. But it was all you know nine months. We were literally working right down to the end of that. Wow. Um, and in fact, after and that was to get our certificate of occupancy. We had to pass, you know, the final inspection with the city and with the bank. Um, but after that, we were still building closet shelves and putting up molding and stuff like that for for a while. In fact, staining, you know, the library shelves and stuff behind me. Um, those weren't stained when we passed the inspection. So, Wonderful. you know, still a bit of stuff to do. Yeah. Kristen, do you want to pull in some comments? I know oh, we've got the room this, is going cuckoo out there. Oh my goodness, this comment um, I was just laughing about. Cheryl Locke says, I think it's great that a family can build a house and no one ended up being part of the foundation. <laughs> and I guess, you know, I was just thinking of your two year old. <laughs> um, and, and also, um, there's a little bit of kudos going out to. Um, to Sean Mohan, who um, says he renovated the 17th century thatched cottage here in the UK, mm, yeah. um, and it was very complex as we had to do it in keeping with the historic materials, um, and he said it's not quite like you, so kudos to him. Yes. Oh, I would rather build a house from scratch than renovate a house any day of the week. Uh, once you start pulling stuff apart, I've done that as well with, I had some rental properties, and once you start pulling things apart, you have no idea what's going to be under there and how much work you're really getting into. So, that, yeah, that is an amazing task. <laughs> so you guys, 
have gone through your inspection, you're mm -hmm. finishing up the final details, um, are the kids just going cuckoo excited? Um, you know, it it took us a while. Um, even even just getting to the very end of the build, we still had to finish selling the house that we were in before we moved into this house. And we're, like I said, we're finishing shelves and things. But um, we had to recover from the exhaustion, which we were still trying to do when we moved in. And we moved in on March 30th of 2009. And we moved all of most of our things over here, our clothes and our beds and things. And we slept here for the first time that night. And we woke up the next morning, um, and and that would have been the time that we started to really celebrate, I think, and sink in and relax and feel like we'd accomplished something. But I actually got a phone call that morning from the hospital, and my mom, who was 59 and extremely healthy, and had been, she had helped with the house um, about every other weekend or at least once a month. She was here to cook over the campfire and to help me build things and to help take care of Roman as well. Um, but she had a blood clot in her lung, and she passed away that day. So that was the first day that we lived here in our house. So that that kind of stole away any possibility of a a feeling of relief or celebration in what we had accomplished. Um, actually, for a couple of years, I think. You know, I, I inherited my brother. I have a disabled brother, and so I inherited him, and I actually care for him. He lives in um, what used to be one of my rental properties, and. Um, He's about 10 years old mentally, so, uh, you know, I had that responsibility as well as taking care of my mom's things and just the loss, of course, of your mom. So it, it really took a while. Um, like I said, a couple of years before I think we all settled in and felt the gravity of, wow, this is sort of really cool what we did. And at the time that we built it, it did not seem like a huge, profound thing. It seemed like a very difficult thing. Um, but it was not something I had ever planned, you know, to speak about a lot or to um, or to write about. It honestly, at the time, seemed like, of course, we'd do that. Like, who wouldn't? We need a house. We need, you know, an inexpensive way to get it. Um, honestly, it can't be that hard to build a house. So that's what we'll do. And it's the decision came so naturally. Um, and I think because we had been through so much trauma that it nothing nothing seemed big like it would now like right now I would never come to that conclusion um, but I wasn't coming from a normal situation I was coming from a difficult situation so you know a difficult task didn't seem as overwhelming as it would now but um, yeah so it, we eventually got to the point I remember and we had lived here for for about a year and a half and my daughter was having some trouble at school, my youngest daughter. And her older brother was talking to her and you know, kind of talking her through it. And I was in another room and I could just overhear what he's saying to her and encouraging her. And, you know, she just kept expressing that she was really frustrated. Um, you know, it was this kind of girls in junior high school bickering and, and being mean to each other situation. And at one point he stopped and he said, Jada, you built your own house. You can do anything oh. and so it, you know it was that feeling of up until that point you kind, we kind of all I think were wondering was it worth it I mean we gave up so much um, so much of our life had been devoted to that for so long we didn't have a social life we didn't have friends we you know we didn't do anything but work for so many years um, you know, taking care of my mom's things and selling our rental properties right after we built the house. So, you know, you just had this sense of, you know, could I have spent that time better? Um, could I have spent more time with my mom? And so, you you know, what have I given to my kids? Have I just put them through torture or did they gain something from it? So then, you know, that was the absolute realization for me. And from that point forward, I see just example after example of how it has changed and empowered them and how how long that we lived in fear and now the way that they approach approach everything in life absolutely fearless I mean they dive in my son just lived in Alaska for a year and a half and now he's in Denver at Metropolitan State University and my oldest daughter has graduated from college and she's traveled she's lived in LA and Washington DC you know and they they'll just they'll jump in and do anything um, with this this really 
calm evaluation of, okay, you know, I have the strength to do this. I know I'm capable. I know I can Google it along the way if I need to. And that there's a YouTube video for anything I need. Um, and they do. Um, my son, you know, when we'd need new brakes in a car after that, he'd, he'd be like, okay, which car needs brakes? Uh, hold on, let me Google it. Yeah, I, I think I can do that. I'll go buy the brakes and put them in. You know, so he just had this this concept of they can do anything. And, and it's wonderful. That's so uh, it, it was absolutely worth it. But I may not have said that at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, wa I wanted to ask about the, the effect of the building on the relationships that you had with your children at the time. And, and I, I guess now, you know, your relationships are all very close because of the experiences that you've been through. Well, I think that any time a family goes through um, any kind of profound experience, I've, I've talked to a lot of families that have gone through domestic violence experiences and it's really difficult for them to be close after that. Um, there's so much blame that goes through even toward the the parent who was a victim. You know, the children tend to blame that parent too for not getting them out of that situation. And I find that so many families really struggle after after you know they leave that situation. And that has not been the case with us at all. I really feel like doing something big and profound like this that really changes how you see yourself. And you know that's what that gave us. And without a doubt, it made all of us so much closer. Um, you know, me to each of my kids, and also them to each other. And there's there's no doubt they have their little bickering moments. And you know, but they they're always trying to help each other and try to plan each other's lives. And you know, well, you know what you could do. Here here's a future job for you. You know, and they're texting and and emailing each other job possibilities and career possibilities or businesses that they think that our family should start, you know. Um, it's very much a camaraderie. And with all of these shared memories, you know, even the really difficult ones and the really hard ones, you know, that we can laugh about now and um, bits and pieces of the house that, you know, we know are totally wrong that no one else knows <laughs> um, that we can kind of giggle about. And, uh, you know, just just the the overwhelming thought where we can just stand around and go, how did we do this? Um, my girls and I tried to hang up a shelf a couple of years ago in one of their bedrooms, and it was this big heavy shelf, and you know it was three of us. It was me and the two girls trying to hold this shelf up and level it and screw it into the wall, and we worked on it for like three hours, and there's like this whole line of holes all over the wall when we're done, and so we're all like. We can't even hang a shelf on the wall. How did we build a house? You know, so it's just this constant frame of reference for everything that we do. Um, yeah, but there's no doubt we're all extremely close. And I think that had had we done something easier, say had I bought a smaller house and piled us all in it, um, I really think that we would have lost something as a family that we never could have regained. And I don't know what the answer is for every family, because I certainly wouldn't recommend that every family go out and build their own house. But when you've been through something that traumatic and you have pulled deep inside yourselves and you know that your family relationship is not there anymore, you have to find something that you can unite to do as a family that is so big and profound that it changes how you see yourselves and each other. Um, it has to be big because it has to rework everything in your mind, all of the pathways of uh, you know of of how you see your own strength. Um, I, I think it's the only way out of that kind of fearful living. Because what you've taught them is uh, life skills. You've taught them to be independent, to be self, you know, self motivated, and to be thinkers about the world. And you know, those skills uh, are so rare in this world today. We had this this sort of motto that um, we used while, while we built the house, and I, I think that it, I'm not even sure where it came about, but once I started recognizing it, I used it over and over again, and we called it the worst case scenario. And this is what I see them taking forth the most in their, their lives. And it was whenever we came across something in the house that we didn't know how to do, which was, which was really often. Um, and but you know there were there were times when it was so over our heads that we had no idea where to start, and we would all just kind of stand and stare at you know this pile of lumber, 
and we knew we had to build like a diagonal wall that met three different codes and you know I had no idea how to start it and we're all just kind of avoiding eye contact because we want someone else to come up with the first move um, and I'd recognize this sort of fear paralysis that would set in I'd, I'd out stop and throw my hands up and say okay worst case scenario and that was the cue for the kids to say what's the worst thing that can happen here if we try to in this case build something and it all goes wrong what's the worst thing that could happen and um, usually in this case it was we're gonna have to rip it out and build it again and I'd say okay can you live with that the worst thing that could happen is we have to rip this out and do it again can you live with that scenario and you know my son would say yeah we've done that 12 times today <laughs> so um, and I mean and then there's no more fear if you absolutely know that you can live with the worst thing that can happen then I'd say hand me the first board I'll make a cut um, there's a really good chance it's going to be wrong but we'll know one way not to do it and um, the most we can lose is a few dollars in you know nails that we have to cut out with the reciprocating saw and uh, we may lose a couple inches of lumber that we've put so many nails in we can't reuse but primarily we could you know my daughter my youngest daughter Jada one of her jobs was to re-straighten nails that we'd already used <laughs> because we were on a strict budget so um, you know we'd pull those out and hand them to poor Jada and she'd head over to the anvil and flatten them out and um, she also would measure all of our smaller bits of lumber and write the measurements on it so that when and we'd have them stacked up um, you know very orderly by size so that if we needed a 22 piece of inch piece of lumber we wouldn't cut from a brand new 2 by 4 um, we would say okay we need something that's close to 22 inches and, and we'd start there so it you know it was a very efficient build we didn't have big burn piles like a lot of construction workers will who can afford to, to waste pieces but um, yeah, that, that worst case scenario, I see the kids taking that into their lives and that that's how they can evaluate things. Okay, what's the worst thing that could happen if I if I move off to Alaska and go to school? Well, if it doesn't work out, you're going to have to move back home again. Well, you're living at home now. Clearly, you can, you can survive that. So you can live with the worst case scenario. Uh, go to Alaska and, and see the world, you know? So it, it's been a really great, really, really great results from this experience. That's it. It's just the first time I talked to you after um, meeting you on Sean's show. It it's just so unbelievably fascinating. Um, the the incredible nuances of every facet of the thought process for you and your children that changed through this project, Kara. It's just amazing. It, it, it was definitely a journey, you know, and, and like I said, we didn't know it was the journey that it was at the time. I, I say so often, I, part of me really wishes that we did take it more seriously, you know, that first of all, that we would have taken more photos. Um, the only pictures we have are when somebody else was there to take some pictures. If, you know, my mom was there, or my dad flew down from Wisconsin, I think three times while we were building to help. And um, and he has MS, so it was a struggle for him. But he dove right in and helped us build. And um, but any other time, I mean, if one of my kids would have like carried a camera and picked it up to take pictures, they would have been in trouble because it was this big. We don't have time for that, you know. All hands on deck, and um, you know, walk while you talk was a a really big. I don't know how many times my kids heard that because. If you have a story to tell, please tell me. But you walk while you talk. You know, you keep working while you while you speak. Um, there was no there was no pausing for conversation. So, I mean, we just didn't have time. Um, I would work sometimes until two in the morning with the headlights of a car. Um, you know, and then I'd go home and sleep for three hours and go to the office in the morning. So, you know, we every second counted. Um, but yeah, it was it. You know, like I said, I wish I wish we had more pictures, and I think that had I think it would have taken more notes. You know, maybe tried to journal. I don't know when. I don't know when I would have done that, but um, but I wish I had that now. I have some emails that I sent to my family, you know, to my dad and to my aunt while we were writing, and uh, every now and then um, I'm writing a book now about the kids and I building the house. So um, every now and then I'm scanning through these emails and. I'll send one to the kids and I'll be like, okay, here's the to-do list for one month. Like, read this. We were insane. <laughs> I, I couldn't, I don't know how I could accomplish this in six months. And this is what I had, like, for the month of May. Just read it. You know, and it would be, 
an, an exterior list, an interior list, an electrical list, a plumbing list, a shopping list. You know, it was just this insane amount of work that, you know, one family can't accomplish. Um, but, you know, I was just sketching list and list and list off and, and making decisions. You know, it was decide on the shingle color, decide on the brick color, um, you know, and then, of course, have it all delivered. And I had to try to calculate the number of bricks that would be on the house, you know. And so there are all these figures scribbled on it, and then there'll be, like, a coffee stain and a concrete stain on the paper. You know, everything's filthy. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Kristen, mm -hmm. you want to pull up? Do you have comments pinned? I have a couple pinned. Um, I, I just share Lainey's comment. Uh, worst case scenario is a great perspective to live with. I think that's a really good point. That's a very good point. And um, Kevin Burns put up there, um, I got this from Vid yesterday, quote, all families are dysfunctional. The difference is a matter of degree. Put one foot in front of the other and chart a new course. I'm gathering this is precisely what Kara Brookins and her family did. And, you know, the first time we spoke, we talked about um, the, the I don't want to call it work, but, but you said it earlier that, that you do a lot of conversation with families who are going through this. And mm -hmm. you encourage them to pick one profound big thing um, to, to do the, the life change. And, and that's so, so important. Um, just so important to be able to get people to um, change their course through um, what's the worst case scenario. Fantastic. Right. right. Yeah, it's actually difficult when I when I speak to groups, and it doesn't matter what sort of group it is, if it's a domestic violence group or a writing group, um, you know, when I talk about this as just a motivational story, um, how many people come and share their stories, and it's always you know, you're always hoping you're going to hit a group who's going to be like, oh, domestic violence, nobody here who's been through that. Um, but, but that's never happened. You know, you have woman after woman standing who has a story. And um, it's shocking how many older men will come and tell me about their mothers, um, you know, who lived with domestic violence. And, and you know, these are things that, that affected them for their entire lives, and they never found a way to let go. And I really hope and feel that with my kids, that this was a letting go, you know, that this was a building on the foundation, you know, a building forward and upward. And from that point on, we look forward, not back, you know. And, and for me, for that same reason, it's been really hard to write a book. I mean, we've lived in the house for more than five years, five and a half years now. And I'm just finally finding a way to write this book. And it's not fun to write because you know, I don't spend time in those years. Um, I spend time looking forward. So it, it's hard to go back and revisit those things, particularly the domestic violence things, because so many of them I've never discussed with anyone. And, you know, I'd never really intended to. For me, it was something that happened long ago. Um, but I'm finding so much power in the way that I can see them now compared to the way that I saw them then and especially in how I see other people reacting, you know, other women that need these stories. So um, ultimately sharing them will be good and empowering, but initially just getting it on paper is not always fun. Yeah, I can't, I, I could not even imagine living through it the first time, um, mm -hmm. let alone having to, to re-dig and put it through, and um, I just, I don't know how, I don't want to end this conversation. We are 10 minutes over though. Oh um, no. So, we <laughs> so I just glanced down at the clock and went, oh no, we're 10 minutes over. Um, and I just, um, Kristen, is there any um, comments out there that we need to pull on before we say goodbye? And then we're going to let Cara say goodbye. All I can say is that there have been some amazing comments that have come through tonight. And, and people have really enjoyed listening to your story. Great, great. And what is your call to action? What's happening with you now? Um, I know you've got book after book after book coming out and, of course, still writing the new one. Yes, I have one coming out in October. The last in my Time Shifters trilogy will be out in October. And that's a time travel trilogy for young adults. And I've just signed a contract on a psychological thriller, Little Boy Blue, 
and that will be out before the end of the year. So both of those I've been, you know, scurrying to do final editing and, and cover proofs and that sort of thing. And um, I'm writing the, the new one about the house build. I'm actually 255 pages into that one. So um, I'll finish that by the end of the year. I don't know if I'll have it sold by the end of the year, but we can hope. And I have a women's comedy about voodoo um, that will probably be out early next year. I had hoped the end of this year, but really, two this year is enough um, to try to do promos on. So I, I talk a lot about writing on, on Twitter, and I do some YouTube videos, a video diary that I'm doing um, on writing the current book. So you know, I'm, I'm definitely out there and approachable on Facebook or Twitter, and I try to stop into Google Plus, too. So I'd, I'd of course, love to hear from anyone. Yeah, we are um, slowly sucking you in over here to the Google Plus world. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, go find her. Um, I, I've been following her on Twitter since I saw her, and um, a fantastic tweets go through that stream. So, um, And her blog posts are fantastic. Just um, if you need any inspiration, I don't know. I, I found myself saying to myself the other day, well, I could just go build a house, but um, of course I wouldn't do that. Um, but it has been an amazing, amazing conversation. And Carol is just going to jump up and down if we don't at least mention Minecraft before we oh, say goodbye. Yes. yes. Well, I am currently, if you don't play Minecraft, it's sort of a, a pixelated game where you build lots of things and you try to build houses to survive zombie attacks and that sort of thing. And I have an eight-year-old, Roman, who is a Minecraft guru. And we are currently designing our own map that we can share with other people. So um, we have a story behind it that we'll publish along with it. And, you know, it's just a free map that people will be able to download. And um, he is actually doing all of the planning and designing. So I'm just kind of grunt labor. Uh, this is a reversal on the house build. He tells me what to build, and um, I have a bit of influence. I had to build a, a picture for the, the castle floor, so I decided to build a dragon. So I've been making a dragon out of red wool for a castle floor is my latest Minecraft update. So, uh, And I do post pictures of that on Twitter now and then as, as we go along. But um, we're definitely amateurs at Minecraft, but um, it's a way to hang out with my 8-year-old um, I hula hoop with my youngest daughter Jada, who's 18, and we hula hoop with fire and do all sorts of hula hooping tricks and that sort of thing. So I try to, and I, I do crafts and quilting with my oldest daughter, and uh, and my son is a who's in in Denver at Metropolitan State University. He's a big computer geek, and me being a programmer, we do lots of geek stuff together. So each with each of the kids, um, I try to sort of meet them at their level and their interest. And since I'm interested in pretty much everything. Um, you know, I can I can jump in. So it's it's Minecraft these days. Very good. And with uh, uh, I don't know anything about Minecraft, but with a Minecraft goodbye, we will <laughs> see you next week, um, four o'clock Eastern, all points around the globe. And it's been wonderful. And we'll get in the comments and answer some of these questions. So bye, everybody. Closing off episode ten of Healthy You What's Your Path. Bye. bye.